Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Margherita Angelini. Uh, Dr. Angelini is a research fellow at the University of uh, Padua and uh, she will dwell upon uh, the consequences of uh, the fascist and Nazi regime on our subject, contemporary history, in Italy and West Germany. Please, Margherita. Um, the title of my paper has changed because the com scientific committee asked me to, um, um, <laughs> it was a very broad subject, so I will just talk of the period after 1945. The title is Civic Engagement in Higher Education, Shaping Contemporary History in Italy and West Germany after 1945. Contemporary history is a very fluid concept. Its disciplinary boundaries and its definition have varied for com from country to country, from group to group, and even within countries from time to time. Its characterization is bound to national histories and tradition and to the readings of what can be defined as the nation's modernity. Nevertheless, irrespective of any political situation, contemporary history has subdued a civic engagement to its pedagogy. From its inception, West German contemporary historical research bore a political and social purpose, as the young republic tried to build a democratic civic culture. In Italy, the debate about how to define contemporary history, which had started during the interwar period, continued after 1945, when students and professors upheld the necessity to study the recent past as a civic education. In both countries, historians' debates were centered not only on which sources and methods could conceptualize, contextualize, and historicize recent pasts, but if professional historians should provide an historical understanding of current trends since contemporary history often served states' post-war political projects of fostering democracy. Indeed, after the collapse of any authoritarian regime, an important process of the cultural passage to democracy is coming to terms with the recent past. History, therefore, seems urgently relevant to societies that want to understand the legitimacy of their previous governments. Intellectuals and historians are asked to find explanations to indicate how these governments should be interpreted and remembered and to find their ideological and historical roots. The, institution, sorry, the institutionalization and acceptance of contemporary history is a relatively recent development, and it was influenced from the very beginning by the epoch-making making events of the two world war, wars, of the Holocaust, of crimes against humanity, and of the forced migration of people. In France, Italy, Britain, and Germany, contemporary history was already practiced during the 1920s, and the field unfolded as a critical response to the First World War. Nevertheless, within the European context, both Italy and West Germany were pioneers in establishing contemporary history as a discipline in schools, universities, and research institutes after 1945. Even though the extent to which Italy and West Germany look back to the, at their past varied considerably, both countries had similar problems in dealing with the issues of history and memory. In both states, the watershed of 1945 did not certainly constitute a year zero for these societies, and the years of reconstruction revealed many continuities. A more profound break was traced during the 1960s with the emergence of a new consumer society and the political stabilization that led to a broadening of the democratization process. For these reasons, for the post-war decades, I think it is useful to use the fruitful category of transition, a polysemic word that has an interdisciplinary quality and that allows to intersect macro and micro history. In both countries, 
during the 1940s and 1950s, intellectuals had to fake the breaking of national and political identities, the disruption brought by the forced migration of people, the reshaping of the state borders with the end of the empires, and furthermore, both West Germany and Italy had to deal with the challenges uh, given not only by reconstruction, but also by uh, the creation of renewed concepts of citizenships and of uh, national and European identities within the Cold War partition. In both countries, the education of new generations was as the center of a political but also cultural debate, and historians working in schools, universities, and in the new research institutes created to study contemporary history felt as their duty to perform a public and civic education beyond the portals of the profession itself. In Italy, most of the fascist apparatus had been left untouched and integrated in the new republican order. Therefore, the sources of, oh sorry, <laughs> it's a, uh, the, the comparative perspective helps to single out all of these social, political, and cultural specificities of these transitions, and at the same time, it allows the researcher not to overestimate the uniqueness of the two national experiences. And this is the reason why I'm using a comparative perspective. In Italy, most of the apparatus of the fascist state had been left untouched and integrated in the new republican state. Therefore, the sources of the Italian resistance movement were put not in the pre-existence archives, national archives, or in the historical institutes created during fascism, but in the new institutes for the history of this period uh, opened in 1949. From the mid-1950s, also other institutes tied to political parties were established to promote the study of contemporary history. In this crucial period, the political involvement in party, parties deeply influenced the choice of research themes, as, for example, the focus on the resistance period. The history of fascism was studied from the mid-1960s. Even though historians failed to consider its meaning in the history of the country, the deep reasons for its alliance with Nazism, and the imperialist wars of aggression. These themes would have been studied only during the 70s and 80s, and especially during the 90s. Comparably, in the 1950s, leading West German historians tried to combat a negative view of the national history. Both Nazi crimes and their personal involvement in Nazism remain taboo subjects. Nevertheless, this national consensus, uh, thanks to international pr pressures, brought quite quickly and brought about diverse examinations of the past. First in the early 1960s and then again in the 1980s. Already during the 1960s, even if the majority of Germans still avoided the most unsettling questions, West German historians and legal experts helped reform the approach to recent past. Hans Woller, in discussing the different attitudes towards contemporary history in Italy and West Germany, has noticed that the earlier approach of German historiography towards its recent past was not due to any German virtue, but to the international pressures. Furthermore, the attention of Italian historiography on the two years of the Italian resistance movement was certainly due to ideological reason, but also to the state's archives law, which established a 40-year rule. This was very significant for the post-war practice and concept of contemporary history. Not until after 1945 was a 30-year rule established in West Germany, and with one exception, the documentation of West Germany's immediate past. Establishing a reliable, a reliable documentary record of the Nazi regime, uh, regime brought to the foundation of the Institut für Zeitgeschichte, the Institute for Contemporary History, opened in Munich in 1950 and where many young historians began their career. Nevertheless, the importance of this and of other institutes did not mean that the universities entirely abstained from dealing with contemporary history, as uh, Berlin, the Berlin, uh, Munich, and Tübingen case studies demonstrate. At the newly founded Free University of Berlin, courses on contemporary history dominated the curriculum. 
In particular, a series of visiting professors uh, that came from the United States presented a critical view of German uh, contemporary history. Above all, the visit of Hans uh, Rosenberg from Bl Brooklyn, who taught in Berlin over two summer semesters between 1949 and 1950, was highly influential, as Hans Urlich Wehler has remembered. As well as the visit of Aldof Lachnitzer, uh, City College at New York, who regularly lectured on the history of Judaism starting in 1952. Also, more established uh, uh, scholars as uh, Paul Kluke, Hans Herzfeld, or Rich, uh, Richard Dietrich taught uh, uh, on the Weimar Republic or on the Second World War. Um, as far as Berlin is concerned, it is possible to speak of a broad range of contemporary history issue, uh, courses. Uh, that were not restricted to the Weimar Republic, but also included the history of the Third, Third Reich, uh, foreign policy, and uh, the Second World War. Uh, starting in the mid-1950s, uh, the dissolution of the Third Reich uh, and uh, of the Weimar Constitution and the, the seizure of power of Hitler enjoyed great interest. As the 1950s uh, drew to an end, uh, the resistance movement became a popular subject. At the University of Tübingen, where in 1962 the Seminar für Zeitgeschichte uh, for Contemporary History was established, already during the 1950s, some of 25% of courses concerned topics in contemporary history. Hans Rolzfeld taught the history of the Weimar Republic and of the Third Reich. Um, it is interesting to notice that the historian in his writing created an image of a Germany in which the Nazi rule of terror over non-German populations could not occupy the stage in historical discourse because positive counterexamples could be found in the conservative resistance movement, assuming therefore a decisive importance in evaluating the most recent past. Anyway, it is interesting also to notice that in West Germany, the first attempt to define the field of contemporary history came from Rotsfeld, uh, that considered uh, this period as the period that became, became that, it was, uh, that started with the double chisura of the Russian Revolution and the end of the First World War. Yet, as far as integrating the Third Reich into the canon is concerned, the history departments in Munich, Berlin, and Tübingen were exceptions. In Heidelberg, for, in Heidelberg, for instance, where Johannes Kuhn, Werner Konzen, and Reinhard Koselleck taught modern history, the Thir Third Reich remained a sort of poor cousin. About 11% of all history courses dealt with the 20th century, but the Third Reich hardly figured in them. It was not until 1955 that a special lecture course on the Nazi dictatorship was offered and it was dedicated to the resistance movement. In these decades, a new generation of historians started to press also for the introduction of contemporary history in schools, even though in Germany this subject was already uh, taught before. This was regarded as essential for the civic education of new citizens. In West Germany, in the years after 1945, American occupation officials deemed instructions in Germany's recent developments to be indispensable to democratization's efforts. New guidelines published after the war stressed the significance of instructions in contemporary history and required that history instructions uh, addressed World War I, the Weimar Republic, the Third Reich, and World War II. Lessons in Zeitgeschichte were also supposed to address post-war developments, including in the division of Germany, the outbreak of the Cold War, and the emergence of peaceful international organizations. Many experienced teachers opposed some resistance to these, um, uh, to these reforms. In Italy, <laughs> Comparably, Ernesto Ragionieri and Roberto Battaglia were both young historians who upheld the necessity to teach the resistance within uh, the schools. 
The demand came also from uh, older generations of historians who held a congress in Perugia in 1952. And these, this meeting coincided uh, with the Shelba law against neo-fascist activities. And therefore, pressed by parliament, the president of the chamber, Antonio Segni, promised to introduce the resistance into the school curricula. This initiative brought uh, Luigi Salvatorelli to write the first, one of the first uh, histories of fascism that was distributed in schools. The preoccupation of the Christian Democrats and of other parties blocked the, this process. In Italian university, the first chair of contemporary history was won by Giovanni Sfavadellini in 1962. Uh, one year after, uh, contemporary history was, inter uh, was uh, so put in the school curricula in 1961. Um, until the 1960s, there was no uh, thesis on uh, um, fascism, but in the 1950s, the first thesis on the resistance movement started to be written uh, under the supervision of Armando Saita and Guido Pazza. This was part of a longer process that brought some well-known Italian historians, Carlo Morandi, Walter Maturi, Federico Chabot, who taught in Florence, Pisa, uh, and Turin, and Rome, uh, to um, keep uh, courses on contemporary Italian and non-Italian uh, contemporary history. Here I brought some examples. Carlo Morandi uh, taught about the relationship between Italy and Russia up to 1917, taking a course that he already was uh, teaching before uh, during fascism, on European unity, on the origins in, of Second World War, and he followed uh, these lessons, uh, publishing some uh, very important books. Walter Maturi spoke about uh, the Risorgimento period and uh, talked about very rec recent political interpretations and published uh, uh, books on this, uh, these topics. Federico Chabot uh, lectured on the idea of nation and the concept of Europe, uh, two, uh, two, uh, less, uh, two courses that he already held during the 1943-1944, and uh, lectured in Paris about contemporary history, one of uh, the first book that had been published in the country on this topic. Um, Chabot in this book made a clear distinction between fascism and Nazism and the roots of these two uh, ideologies. Um, and he concluded that uh, uh, the war of the Partigiani had been against a dictatorship and for liberty, but also against the reckless adventure to which fascism led Italy during its alliance with Germany in the Second World War. Um, the historians of this period were high, were influenced by the interpretation of fascism of Benedetto Croce, who explained that fascism had to be considered as a parenthesis in the national history. A comparative analysis of the Italian and West German debates on contemporary history in the immediate post-war decades allows to examine the building of the nation's democratic conceptions and of the idea of citizenship. The nation is, as we know, is by no means a fixed notion. It can be fragmented, multidimensional, and variable, and historians have defined it with competing approaches and contradictory positions. This emerges very clearly when analyzing the German and Italian debates on their respective special paths towards modernization. Uh, there is no time now uh, to analyze uh, these uh, um these positions and how they were then thought in uh, universities. But uh, it's obviously uh, interesting uh, to remind uh, the debates uh, of the Bielefeld School that uh, had a, a considerable uh, um, uh, importance in innovating uh, the discipline in Germany and the debates in Italy on the, the thesis around, uh, uh, around Gramsci's thesis. Uh, partially because of the transnational context that would, would link both countries also through new institutions, as for example in 1973 the foundation of the Istituto Storico Italo Germanico in Trento, the historical institute, uh, the, these debates show, show striking similarities across national and cultural differences. In conclusion, I would also want to remember 
that in this uh, context, it's very important to uh, analyze also the agencies that produced the shifts and opening in contemporary history that were also based not only on a national, uh, not only in the national arena. The writing and teaching of Italian and German history was never an exclusively national affair. British, American, and French historical debate had a great import importance in the post-war era, as well as institutional points of context, as the Wiener Library in London or the University of Reading from the mid-1960s. In the latter, for example, Stuart Woolf was closely involved with the Graduate School of Contemporary European Studies, and uh, this school uh, produced a series of seminar, se seminars on fascism on a comparative scale, where Tim Mason and Renzo De Felice, the first uh, person who wrote on uh, fascism in Italy, went. Uh, Woolf came also in Italy and had uh, several projects between, that he, he uh, promoted, and he uh, went to the important first conference on Gramsci at Cagliari in 1977, and uh, held an intensive three-day course at Pisa in 1969 on post-fascist Italy. In conclusion, this, these examples demonstrate how a comparative transcultural and transnational analysis can stress the many and complex processes of interdependence and interrelation between intellectuals, universities, and historiographies, which between the 1960s and 1970s would have been fundamental to the growth and establishing of the field. Thank you. Thank you, Margherita, for your uh, paper, which is a, an important contribution to the history of historiography, a field in which, uh, uh, on which uh, Margherita has already uh, written extensively. I would like to remember, among her publications, uh, transmitting knowledge, uh, the professionalization of Italian historians, uh, 1920s, 1950s. 